Viewers in Nigeria and across the world, lunchtime politics begins right now. Well, it's a Black Wednesday as Ondo State Governor Rotini Akiridulu dies after a protracted battle with leukemia. Nigeria Governor's Forum mourns his death, describes him as an exceptional statesman. Earlier on, President Tinubu met with state governors as he calls for greater collaboration between state and federal government as it condemns the killings in Plateau State. A trade union Congress President Festus Osifo hopeful for a drop in the price of petrol in the new year owing to the coming on stream of Port Harcourt and Dangote refineries. begin with the sad news of the death of the governor of Ondo State, Mr. Rotimi Akeridolu. Mr. Akeridolu, popularly called Aketi by his supporters, died this morning after a long battle with leukemia. Well, he had gone on a medical leave exactly two weeks ago on December the 13th. That was after transmitting power to his deputy, Mr. Loki Ayedatiwa, in acting capacity. Well, let's now bring you a highlight of events in Ondo State, particularly as it concerns the late governor's health. Well, Mr. Kirdalu had been ill for some time and has been out of public glare before proceeding on medical leave to Germany on January, or rather in January 2023, and on June the 7th, embarked on a 21-day leave for medical treatment abroad, having written to the State Assembly and transmitted power to his deputy, Mr. Loki Ayedatiwa, However, did not return until three months after to em the embrace of his supporters. But instead of returning to Ondo State, the governor stayed back in Ibado, the Oyo State capital. Things, however, took a turn on Tuesday, December the 12th, when he wrote to the House of Assembly requesting to proceed on another medical leave and asked the House to approve his deputy to act as a governor in his absence. Earlier on this month, uh, Babajide Akirdalu, the late governor's son, was reported to have sought the president's assistance to get an air ambulance to return his alien father to Germany, where he had been receiving treatment. On Wednesday, December the 13th, Mr. Akirdalu proceeded on another leave a day after the assembly confirmed the receipt of his letter and confirmed Mr. Ayidatiwa as acting governor. Uh, the governor, according to his aide, was to during that medical leave prioritize his health and ensure a full recovery before resuming his official duties. However, that was not to be, as news filtered in early today, that the governor had passed after a long battle with leukemia at the age of 67. Well, condolences have been pouring in over the demise of Governor of Ondo State, Mr. Rutimia Kirdalu. The Nigeria Governor's Forum has expressed sadness on this death, describing him as an exceptional statesman whose indelible marks in public service will be forever remembered. In a statement by the chairman of the forum and the governor of Kwara State, Mr. Abdurrahman Abdurazak, the governor sent their condolences to the Progressive Governors Forum, the people and government of Ondo State, the Nigerian Bar Association, as well as the immediate family of Mr. Akiridolu. The forum describes him as a frontline lawyer and conscientious politician of progressive bend. The governor say the former governor will be remembered for his courage, patriotism, and immeasurable contributions to the constitutional and sociopolitical development of Nigeria. Well, in another sad development, former Speaker of the House of Representatives, Gali Naba, has died. Uh, he was born on September the 27th, 1958. Now, the late Alaji Naba battled a prolonged illness before succumbing to it. Elijah Naaba, a prominent figure in Nigerian politics, served as a Speaker of the House between 1999 and 2003. His health struggles had previously prompted his medical evacuation abroad for treatment, leading to an extended period away from Nigeria. However, he successfully recuperated and returned to his home country. Initially affiliated with the People's Democratic Party, PDP, he represented the Kano Municipal Federal Constituency 
secured victory during the April 1999 general elections. According to family sources, the remains of the former speaker will be buried in Abuja today, according to Islamic rights. Well, earlier on, before the sad news rolled in, President Bola Tinubu had emphasized that the federal and subnational governments of Nigeria have a mutual responsibility of ensuring the country's peace, development, and stability. He was speaking while receiving the Nigeria Governors Forum at his residence in Lagos yesterday, where he reiterated his condemnation of the latest killings in Plateau State. Condoling the victims, President Tinubu emphasized the sanctity of human life and called for a paradigm shift among those with contrary beliefs, cautioning them about the inevitable consequences of their actions. He also acknowledged the presence of Governor Fubaro of River State at the meeting and commended him for his efforts to resolve the political challenges in the state peacefully. My we have to take care of our people, make life more simple, and educate our people for a change of mindset in the circumstances that we have. Uh, Nigeria belongs to all of us, and we have to take care of it. The Excellency, the Governor of Rivers, um, you know, I read your statement. I said thank you very much for that. Signalship uh, broadcast and reliance on peace. It's only with peace that we can go on and governments have started, you know, in others. To some of you, uh, I don't wear the floor cap for a year I do it. A broken cap that saves my life to ignorance and poverty. And I give our hope. And uh, I will say bye bye to classification. Of Brenda, of Aurora, of St. Louis. Then we got a lot of responsibility. If I have to stay in Abuja alone, it's not easy. Let's look at our children. It's so feeling for the back. Quickly, starting from local government <laughs> to state government and the federal government. Meanwhile, the chairman of the NGF, Kwar State Governor Abdurman Abdurzak, affirmed the support of state governments for the bold decisions and reforms initiated by President Tinabu's administration. He was speaking during that meeting with the president at his residence in Lagos, where he led other governors on the visit. He says the states will also embrace energy transition program for their own economic safety. The serious issues and challenges ahead, which we have to mitigate now, but in our own interest, we will embrace the um, energy transition for our own economic safety. We we'll export our oil. We should have moved to gas 30, 40 years ago because over 70% of our hydrocarbons in the ground is gas, not oil. And we have consistently exported gas without putting the infrastructure in place to use gas domestically. Uh, in Europe, the cooking gas, the cookers in the kitchen, in the water heaters, all is connected to the gas infrastructure. So, in the meantime, the federal government is expanding the gas um, infrastructure through the AKK pipeline, section two of the um, Western pipeline. So we will embrace, for us in the states, we'll work with you, Mr. President. Um, we'll also seek the opportunities that are available from the federal government in terms of agriculture, infrastructure, um, 
Your Vice President, sir, is hands-on on agriculture. Um, since he's been in, um, we've seen the we've seen the seriousness in which agriculture is, is taken. Either during the last administration, everything in agriculture was done in CBN to the extent that nearly all the states they don't have any impact in agriculture. But we've seen a change now. Well, speaking of that meeting uh, where the governor of River State, uh, Similai Fabara, was in and saying that the president commended him uh, for the way he's handled the political situation in Rivers, well, just days after he promised to implement those recommendations in the truce agreement, some elders of the state are saying that the agreement is not in the interest of River State. The elders say they do not I want any did not see any peace in that document, which they describe as the president's peace proclamation. In a statement signed by a former governor of the state, Chief Rufus Ada George, and other members of the Elders Forum, uh, they say the document is a death sentence, which breaches all legal and constitutional rights that the governor swore to uphold. Well, there's a lot still going on on the political scene. And we've seen that the state houses of assembly have played a major role in some of this political drama we've seen across the board in River State. We've seen in Ondo State and some other states uh, in recent times. So let's uh, get a sense of at least what the role of the state assembly is, what it ought to be, seeing that the president has again reiterated the fact that the federal and subnationals need to work together for the development of the nation. We're joined by Right Honorable Adioye Ribasoye, who is a speaker of the Ekiti State Assembly. He joins us virtually on the program this afternoon. Thank you for joining us, uh, Right Honorable, on the program. Well, I'll just begin by uh, asking you, because I know Ondo State is your next door neighbor. In fact, some still consider you to be one, Ekiti and Ondo State. Uh, and I wonder, right, Honorable, how are you receiving the sad news uh, of Governor Rotimi Akirululu's death? Well, I must say, um, yeah, let me say good morning first. Um, good um, afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Sorry. Yeah, uh, the news of um, Governor Rotimi Akirululu's demise is devastating uh, is a great loss. Uh, probably let me quickly drop this. I once worked in his chamber as a Pupi lawyer. Uh, that's only Jimmy Akredo's chamber, uh, the one, the office at Abuja. He was a, a wonderful man and why he was there. And we have missed a great person at a fearless personality, uh, an activist, even as a gun, he was an activist. And I believe that uh, the whole nation will, will miss him. We are, it will miss him, Nigeria will miss him. But mostly affected is Ondo State. And he's a man, he was a man who called his spade a spade. He was a man who will never hide his feelings when he was here. That is what I'm grateful for you. Oh, amazing. Thank you. Uh, I mean, what would you say? Because at moments like this, what people hold on to are those memories. What would you say are the most memorable events for you, seeing that you, you, you uh, have worked uh, under him uh, as a legal practitioner? What for you would you say were memorable events that you would you know, remember him for? Well, uh, Ruth Yagrelu was a meticulous lawyer. Um, like I said, uh, very meticulous. And uh, he always uh, bring out the best in you. Uh, uh, when I was in his chamber uh, with um, Olu Jimmy, though he was uh, already then uh, into politics, uh, uh, the NBA politics, and also the, the president politics. So he was not really on ground. Um, at that time, it was the former Attorney General of the Federation who was actually 
the figure at the chamber, it comes um, occasionally. But I remember some of the briefs that uh, it was thorough when it comes to uh, looking at the briefs, uh, looking at the uh, what we are to present in court. So he was such a meticulous uh, a lawyer and very brilliant, and like I said, a fearless individual uh, who also is still bonus in some of us. Uh, so at least we can stand then, I mean, even till now, uh, uh, to speak uh, to powers, authorities. And you will see that in his approach, even as a governor, that even within his political party, whatever he believes that is not right, he speak out. And that's, that was the man that I know. And that was the Roti Makari Dolu that we, we are mourning at the moment. And I, my own prayer is that God will repose his soul and give us our thoughts, particularly the immediate family, the fortitude to bear this irreparable loss. Thank you. Indeed, a very sad day, uh, definitely. And I mean, it's, it's good to hear some of the experiences you had describing him as a thorough uh, lawyer who wasn't afraid to speak truth uh, to power. You, being a speaker of the AKT State Assembly, uh, you know, I, I referenced earlier on some of the roles we've seen state assemblies play in the nation's politics, particularly in recent times. Uh, we've seen in Ondo. Uh, bef before culminating into the handover uh, of power. We're also seeing in River State, again, the president had to intervene. And it's again raised the question uh, about one, the independence of state assembly in the real sense of it. And we all know that you play a vital role in the democracy that we're trying to build uh, as, as a nation. Uh, for you, how would you rate uh, the performance of state assemblies and uh, what would you say that uh, you're trying to achieve perhaps for you and i know that you also uh, speak for the chairman oh, sorry for the conference of speakers in the southwest and you're also the vice chairman conference of speakers in nigeria so you have that broad view uh, what would you say is your impression so far of state assemblies well let me start with by saying you know our democracy is nascent we are evolving we are developing and uh, if there is any harm of government that has been mercilessly dealt with is when it comes to uh, uh, military taking over, uh, even when you talk about democracy, what is not on ground, when you say there was no democracy, is just the disarm, uh, the legislative harm. Uh, military takes over, uh, scrap, uh, legislative harm. You, they now become the executive and uh, perform the roles of the uh, that hard, and we have judiciary all along. Is but also, um, if you are talking about democracy, the what even democracy is all about is this harm of government, the legislative harm. Uh, I would say we are not doing badly, uh, at least uh, in our uh, presently in this in some states is tenth assembly. This is seventh assembly in the state, but uh, the people can only enjoy dividends of democracy when the legislative arm um, perform its roles uh, duly well. And I can tell you that at the moment, the houses of assembly in Nigeria, um, as I speak with you, are also leading to that bill. They, we are in a state, uh, well, by the grace of God, we enjoy that um, free hand to do what we want to do. Uh, if we come to the house of assembly in a state and see the level of debate, how we debate all issues, we even go out there, um, members come with reports from their various constituencies, um, which we discuss and our resolutions, we, we send to the assembly. Uh, just last week, we passed the 2024 appropriation bill, which was uh, brought to us in October uh, uh, 13. And, and this went through serial legislative scrutiny. Of course, means the NDAs were called upon to defend their budget. And those areas, we, those we consider as volumes, we were not allowed. And then we ensure that what we have in our budget aligns with the key priorities of government and what the people actually, uh, as, as, I mean, yearn it for. Because one of the things we have done in our own house is to also have what we call uh, constituency engagement, uh, outreach, even before right. uh, the passage of the bill to ensure that, yes, this 
uh, budget is also in line with the aspiration of our people and what are the key priorities. We, we also look at the areas of, of infrastructure, what we have in infrastructure, what we have even for the current, what are these current also meant for. We know that where the personnel cost is very critical, but we do not allow anything frivolous in the... Right. Yes, we have. So, and I believe that um, other houses of assembly in Nigeria today are also living to that building to ensure that uh, the people enjoy uh, dividends of democracy. Because without us, uh, there won't be uh, dividends of democracy. Uh, right. We are to also ensure that we have oversight of the executive. We also ensure we have good legislation in place. We also ensure that even, even the, the projects are monitored properly. And all of this we are done, have been done, carried out by the committees of the House. And, and well, the committees right have come back that works. And it's good to hear you break yes, down some of your activities. I think it's important for even civic, civic education yes, I, I, so I, I, people I, I, can know what you do. But yes. speak to us about this. Are you truly independent? In recent times, some have expressed concerns that they've seen state assemblies or members of state assemblies being used as you know, tools in political battles and case in point, Ondo, Rivers and the rest. In, in a true sense of it, as, as state assemblies, independent, yes or no? Well, let me also add this, that uh, yes, when it comes to politics, you know that it's politics that is governance, and uh, the two are intertwined, and uh, sometimes we might not be able to uh, really uh, understand the thing, and there's a thing now between governance and politics, and uh, we all know that uh, when you politics will always be there, but that we should not be at the expense of governance. Uh, whatever is happening, uh, those things that you have mentioned, is politics. But that, that does not mean that governors will also be sacrificed. Uh, to me, I am more particular about governors because that is the only way that people can um, enjoy the dividend of uh, democracy. The other one you mentioned is about who, who gets what, when, and how, like uh, someone defined uh, politics. So it's about politics. And uh, that you mentioned that uh, the House members are being used. No, I won't totally agree with you. But because, like I said, when it comes to democracy, it is this arm that actually meant democracy. There is nothing like democracy without the legislative arm. And that is why focus is always on the House of Assembly when there are political issues, because that is where the new politics is being played. Don't forget that it is only in the House of Assembly that you have all members, including the Speaker, are ele they are elected, unlike the Assembly. Where you only have the governor and the, the deputy the governor, deputy who are elected. governor. Others are appointed. you know, others are appointed uh, at the executive arm. And but, it means that at the executive arm, you might not be able, if you misbehave, the governor will you, you can fire you at any time. Unlike the, the legislative arm, all of us were equal. The speaker and is I just see. first among the youth. Uh, just just to put this in, I see that even in your state assembly, uh, there's been some sort of uh, interesting developments. Uh, 24 APC members, two SDP members, and it's been said that even the SDP members are becoming friendly to the APC members. So maybe that's the politics of things that you talk about. But I'd like you to speak to this very important point, and this concerns governance, as you uh, said. Sorry, You're interested yeah, in governance. Also, yes, you, you will. Yeah, also, but, uh, yeah, just a yeah, moment. You, uh, yeah, let me let me put out the. Okay, you can quickly say that so I can put in this question. Okay, whatever you see in the House of Assembly of the State, it also goes out to the leadership. What I've been able to do under my leadership is right. to carry all members along. Well, I didn't expect you to say anything less, uh, right, Honourable. Naturally, I didn't expect you to say anything less as the chairman of the Southwest uh, Speakers and the vice chairman of the National. But speak to this. When the president called for more collaboration between FG and subnationals, you will also play a key role in talking about the state assemblies because I expect you to be drafting laws to sort of align with the president's vision. He said, don't see this road as federal, state, or what have you. Let's see it as our road. There's a big issue regarding security as well. Well, let's have some sort of security architecture that states can also control. So if you could list two most important things that you want states to get involved with, to partner with the federal government more so we can have better dividends of this democracy and governance, what would it be, right, Honorable? Well, uh, of course, I've always been an advocate of uh, devolution of power. 
And uh, one of the things I believe that, uh, to me, it is important that uh, EU security um, concurrent list that the state should be able to legislate. I don't also believe in uh, when you say the governors are chief security officers and they don't have absolute control over the police. Uh, that, of course, will continue to have issues around security. So, uh, we, of course, it's part of my agenda uh, at the moment that uh, I am also taking to my brothers in the southwest and uh, even to the uh, entire um, conference of speakers that we should also look at how we can also um, allow our voice to be heard on the right. issue of power, particularly the area of security. Uh, that uh, that's, uh, People are afraid of state police, uh, right. believing that probably, uh, the, to me, advantage of state police is more than disadvantage. Uh, right, Honorable, I, I know this is a conversation we can go on and on with, but clearly we'll still have to come back to you because those bills will come to the state assemblies if they eventually passed at the national. But we'd like to thank you so much uh, for taking time out of the mm -hmm. Yule Tide to speak with us. Right, Honorable Adeoye, Arubasoye is a speaker of the Akita thank Assembly. You. Thank you so much for your time, Speaker. Uh, I'm grateful for having me. Thank you. Ah, the president of the Trade Union Congress, that's the TUC, Mr. Festus Osifu, is hopeful that the pump price of petrol could actually drop in the coming year, 2024, as in-country crude refining capacity increases, as refiners come on stream, including the Port Harcourt and Dangote refinery, which are expected to start production in the first quarter of next year. While reviewing 2023 labor and federal government relationship, he told Channels Television that apart from the re-emergence of refineries in the country, the international crude oil price will also have a role to play in determining the pump price of petrol next year. Uh, with the crude price coming down the way it is, I think it's around $75 per barrel. If the crude price comes down substantially to somewhere around $50 per barrel, you are going to see a significant reduction in the price of PMS. So the question is, what do we want? Do we want the crude price to keep going up so that Nigeria as a state will keep making more money, or we want the crude price to come down so that the PMS price will come down? For me, and for us in the labor movement, anything that will reduce the price of PMS that Nigerian workers and the Nigerian masses you know, um, are subjected to, that is what we key in for. But specifically on the refineries, yes, when your refineries are working, when you produce locally, if for nothing, the handling cost is reduced. When you produce locally, uh, the price of PMS will naturally be reduced. Uh, by, by what percentage? That depends on a lot of factors. What are the, uh, I mean, uh, your utilization capacity of your refineries? How, what is the efficiency of your refinery? What is the efficiency of your logistics processes? So all these will come in, but overall, the price certainly will reduce. Before we go, let's tell you that Vice President Kashim Shatima was billed to visit victims of a Christmas Day attack in Barkinladi and Bokos local government areas of Plata State today. However, we understand that his itinerary has changed and he will no longer be visiting uh, those areas. Ahead of the visit, the NSA, Noah Ribado and Chief of Defense Staff General Christopher Musa had arrived at Yakubu Gowan Airport as well as Governor Kelef Motwang, uh, who flew in from Lagos where they had met with President uh, Bola Tinubu. Well, details of the new itinerary and the reason for the change have not been made known just yet. Well, that's lunchtime politics for today. Thank you for watching. I'm Kaido Kikuna. Goodbye.